Good evening, students. Welcome to today's lesson summary review. Tonight we're on our lesson for John chapter 6 and 7. This is the course relating to Christ, John's gospel. And so prayerfully you've been informed as you reviewed our previous chapters of this lesson. And this session will help us to understand Jesus as Lord, as evidenced in his feeding of the 5,000, his walking on water, his bread of life discourse, and teaching at the Feast of Tabernacles. So those are going to be some of the topics that we will discuss as we look at John chapter 6 and 7 of this course. And as always, we want each and every one of you to always take time for personal reflection as you begin to prepare for your lesson studies. Always pray for other students who are studying around the world that they will also be able to be enriched by the lesson material and that they will be used by God to impact our world in a positive way for the kingdom of God. And so let's prepare to get ready to start our lesson review now. If you have your study guide you'll know that we're going to be looking at pages 54 through 73. Your study guide assignment is lesson 6 and 7. So what we're going to do is review the lesson plan and we're going to look at the activities of this particular course assignment. Now in introduction for this week's lesson, I want you to think about if you had some type of bread to eat and think about what kind of bread it is, where you brought it from and how you made it if you made it or how the persons that you purchased it from may have made it. I want you to do this because I want you to describe the importance of bread to diets, particularly in the time of Jesus. I also want you to note that we all know where we get physical bread from, but finding spiritual bread can be more difficult. Some people look in the strangest places, and some mistakenly believe that they can live without it. But just as it would be impossible for our physical bodies to live without bread, which means food, so it is for our spiritual lives. We must feed our spirit with spiritual food just as we feed our bodies with natural food. And so here we are looking at John chapter 6 verses 1 through 15. You'll find this on pages 54 through 57 of your study guide. And this session talks about Jesus feeds the 5,000. So the objective of this session is to explain the lessons of the feeding of the 5,000. And as you look over that section of your study guide, I like to comment that sometimes it is easier to believe God for eternal life than for a job or physical healing or reconciliation of a marriage. So let me ask you a question. When did you begin to trust God in a practical way. And when we talk about practical ways to meet our ordinary daily needs of our present physical life. So I'd like to point out, as you think about that, that the way we face life difficulties reveals much about our faith. If we were to review how Philip and Andrew tackled the problem of feeding the 5,000 men, their wives and children, we can see two things stand out. You'll see in this text that Philip began the discourse with a little bit of doubt in his heart. How can we feed such a large number of people? Now, remember how we began this lesson where we talked about the importance of bread or food to our physical sustenance. So here are, the, here are some of the facts that we can look at. So Philip, being a good businessman, he calculates how much it would cost to feed the crowds. 
Okay? And so it will cost a tremendous sum, he says in verse number seven, which they did not have. So his conclusion, after doing his calculations, is it's impossible. Next we look at Andrew. Andrew looks to the people while Philip looked at the facts. So Andrew being a problem solver, he plunges into the crowd and finds a boy with a few barley loaves and two small fish. He says basically something is better than nothing. So let me ask you this question. What parallel is there between the way the man at the pool handled his problem in our last lesson and the way Philip and Andrew handled theirs? Now, if you think about that for a moment, perhaps your answer will be something like this. All three put their faith in what they could see. The man by the pool put his eyes and faith on the pool. In the case of Philip and Andrew, they placed their faith in finances and other people. See, they could not see beyond the natural, and they failed to look to the spiritual, which Jesus was trying to get them to see. And when we say see spiritually, we're not talking about glancing through our natural eyes. We'll be like seeing in the spiritual realm or sensing in the spiritual realm what God is doing. So I want to ask you another question as you look at that section. Why did Jesus confront Philip and Andrew with this impossible problem when he already had in mind what he was going to do? Look at verse 6 of that chapter to see that discourse. Well, the answer is that Jesus wanted to make their faith grow. I want you to read James chapter 1 verse 24 and explain that the only way that we can consider difficult circumstances with joy is if we know who is in control of the circumstances. The gospel record is clear. Jesus as Lord is always in control. You'll see a reference for this in Luke chapter 1 verse 37. So here again, Jesus wanted their faith to grow to the point that they would not be overwhelmed by the circumstances. And the same is true for us whenever God asks us to do something that seems to be impossible. Now, I want to emphasize that there is nothing wrong with taking inventory of available resources. God expects us to use the resources available to us. But even if these prove insufficient, which they did in this case, he expects us to turn to him, give him our meager resources, and allow him to bless them and multiply them. So that's what we learn from the parable of Jesus, the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, and how it challenged the faith of his disciples. God wants to challenge our faith at times also, students. Let's take a look at our second section of the lesson, which will deal with Jesus walks on the water. You'll find this in John chapter 6, verses 16 to 21. And in your study guide, this is on pages 57 to 58. Now, the second objective asks us to explain how the event of Jesus walking on the water shows that Jesus is the Son of God. So go ahead and review that section of your lesson again. And while you do so, i like to comment that in performing the miracle of multiplication of the bread and fish to feed the multitude, Jesus revealed himself as Lord of creation. Now, in coming to the rescue of the disciples in the midst of a storm at sea, Jesus reveals himself as Lord over nature. He walks on the water and moves the disciples' boat immediately to shore. I like to stress at this point, students, that what Jesus did for the disciples 
that is rescued them from a storm, he does for us. He rescues us from difficulties. No matter what storm of life we may be going through, Jesus rescues us just as he did the early disciples from the storms of our life because he cares for us. In his own way and time, he brings us through our storms as well. So that's what we can gain from that section of Jesus walks on water. Let's take a look at the next section of our lesson, which deals with Jesus, the bread of life, and the words of eternal life. Here again, we're looking at John chapter 6. This time we're looking at verses 25 through 71. You'll find this on pages 59 through 62 of your study guide. Now this third objective asks us to explain what Jesus meant when he described himself as the bread of life. So let me comment here that the crowd seeks Jesus to have their physical hunger satisfied. And this is true of all human nature. Man is certain that what he needs is more bread, that is physical food, or more money, or more resources, material resources. Oftentimes we do not consider whether we need something else. So let me ask you a question, students. Have you ever thought that you needed something only to find out later that that thing was not what you needed at all? Now, if you ponder that question, I want to stress the importance of asking God for what we really need. If you look at John chapter 6, verse 29, you will note the crowd's question in verse 28, to which Jesus responds, shows that they put their whole emphasis on what they themselves could do to earn God's approval. I want you to know that faith in Christ is unique among the world's religions in its emphasis on God's grace, not on works. Our works flow from an attitude of gratitude for God's grace to be bestowed upon our lives in Christ Jesus. It's important that we don't get into a works mentality because we are all saved by grace through faith in Christ. Now with that, I'd like to ask you a question. What does Jesus offer the crowd instead of bread? We see that he offers himself and through him, he offers eternal life. He offers to meet their deepest needs if they would simply eat of him, that is, to take him into their lives. Now, there's a visual aid for this part of our lesson. If you don't have a copy of the visual aid, contact us. We'll send you a copy of the visual aid, which describes the four responses to Jesus' offer. Let's take a look at our next session which talks about Jesus and his brothers. Now we're going to be looking at John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, which you will find in your study guide on pages 64 through 65. And this first objective of this section asks us to explain the importance of patience in dealing with unbelievers. So the lesson asks us to read John chapter 1 verses 1 through 9, excuse me, John chapter 7 verses 1 through 9. And it wants us to identify the tone of Jesus' brothers. And I particularly want you to note that it is one of sarcasm. Where you see it mentioned, brother, if you are such a star, why aren't you where people will notice you? That was the emphasis of some of their comments that was made to Jesus. 
by his disciples. You see, it is after Jesus' resurrection that they come to believe. But while Jesus was still amongst them, many of them doubted and did not fully believe what they had never experienced before. So they appear with the apostles and believing women soon after his ascension that, that they began to believe in the things that Jesus had spoke while he was alive. Significantly, two of them became prominent in the early church. James was a leader of the Jerusalem church. You'll see in Acts chapter 15, verse 13, the role that he played in the church in Jerusalem. And he wrote the epistle of James. Later, Jude wrote the epistle of Jude. But we see that before Jesus' death, they were sarcastic about the role that Jesus could really have and could he really fulfill the grandiose statements that he had made to them. So I want you to think about something here. I want you to think about their level of patience. Think about your level of patience regarding salvation of unsaved family members and friends. And I want to encourage each of you to be more patient with those who refuse to believe at first. Just as we see the example of James and John in the text that we just looked at, they were slow to believe. Jesus often chastised his early disciples because of their little faith or lack of faith. So we must likewise be patient regarding the salvation of our unsaved family, friends, and loved ones. Let's look at our next section of the lesson, which talks about Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, you'll see reference for this section in John chapter 7, verses 10 through 24. And in your study guide, you'll find this on pages 65 through 67. Now, here, our second objective asks us to describe the three popular attitudes toward Jesus and explain Jesus' teaching at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if you have a blank sheet of paper or something to write on, I want you to list on a writing surface the three attitudes toward Jesus based on verses 10 to 13. And if you looked at that verses correctly, you'll see number one, you can write this down. Some watched for an opportunity to kill him. That was one attitude toward Jesus. A second attitude is some defended him saying he was a good man. And a third attitude toward Jesus was some thought he was an imposter, deceiving the people. Now, I want to have each of you identify and explain the condition and promise of Jesus' statement that he made in John 7, verse 17. I want you to look at that portion of scripture, John chapter 7, verse 17. And I want you to identify and second, to explain the condition and promise of Jesus' statement contained in that portion of scripture. Now, if you looked at it correctly, the condition that we can identify is that it is a matter of a person's will. It's a matter of a person's will. The promise is that if people come to Jesus with their minds set against him, they will not come to know the truth that Jesus is who he claims to be, God's son and our savior. So that is the condition that Jesus is speaking of about those who are hard to believe. That a person must come to him with their minds set not against them, but their minds must be set and be open to believe upon him in order to come to know the truth. What truth do they need to receive, students? 
is that Jesus is who he claims to be. God's son and our savior. So if people meet the condition of coming with their minds open and not closed against them, Jesus promised us in that text of scripture. The promise is that if people come with their hearts oriented towards God and with a desire to know him and do his will, then they will know the truth of Jesus teaching. And also let like to explain that the Holy Spirit will be at work with their spirits and will lead them into the truth. You see, students, God never compels anyone to believe. He always lets us exercise our own free will. Here's a question I want to ask you in regards to this section before we move to the next session. How does Jesus justify his healing of the lame man on the Sabbath. We see that he refers to the custom of circumcising an infant on the eighth day, whether or not that fell on the Sabbath. You see, the fact that the law of Moses permitted this, the breaking of the rule of not laboring on the Sabbath, indicates that the person was more important than the rule. That's a very profound statement Jesus wanted to emphasize with those who were law keepers. You never put the law above the people that the law is there to protect and serve. So here's our next section of the lesson here. It's going to talk to us about some questions that people ask Jesus. We're going to look at some of the guards. As they inquired about Jesus, we're going to see how Jesus described himself as living water. We're going to see some uh, examples of division and unbelief amongst his disciples and those who heard him preach and teach. So for this section, we're looking at John chapter 7, verses 25 through 52. And this third objective, our final objective for this lesson review asks us to explain Jesus' climatic appeal and the response to it. Now, as you look at that section of your lesson, we know that the Feast of Tabernacles was a joyous, week-long feast celebrating the completion of the fall harvest. It commemorated God's goodness to the people during their desert wanderings. So it was a celebratory time where people were thankful and praying for rain. Now, each day a procession of priests went to the Gilhan Spring to fill a gold pitcher with water while they had a choir of songstress that was saying Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Then the procession returned to the temple where the priest poured the water into a silver funnel which emptied into the ground under the altar. And it was on the last day of the celebration that Jesus stood up to make his astounding declaration that we find in verses 37 to 38, where Jesus says, I am the living water. Realizing the significance that they placed on the water in the golden pitcher and being poured into a silver funnel. Jesus wants you to know that water is natural, but I am a living water. Read, go ahead and read again if you haven't to refresh your memory. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 38. And as you do so, I want you to answer this question. What did Jesus mean by living water? Well, if you Look at that text, a portion of scripture in context. You'll see that verse 39 identifies the water as the Holy Spirit. You see, water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit in scripture. It is a symbol of the Holy Spirit that the resurrected Christ would give this spirit, this living water to believers and that is what happened on 
the day of Pentecost. I also want to remind you students that living water also has reference to eternal life that is provided through Jesus' work of salvation. You see references for this in John chapter 4, verse 10, as well as verse 14 of John 4. So in conclusion for our lesson review for this week, I want each of you to identify various groups throughout these two chapters, John chapter 6 and 7, who denied that Jesus was the Christ. We can see a crowd of Jews. We see many of Jesus' disciples. We see Jesus' brothers. We see the chief priests, as well as the Pharisees. And I also want you to identify people that you know who deny Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. See, sometimes we may become discouraged with their refusal to accept Christ and even give up on them. I want to stress that God, however, does not give up on them. The people may simply not be interested in what you are presenting to them if you're not presenting Christ in Christ alone. So if you're talking about come visit your church because your pastor has good sermons or your choir because they have good songs or the children's ministry because they provide life activities, that is not the answer to a person's spiritual need. So understand that Jesus' own brothers came to believe later on and became leaders in the early church. So we must persevere in praying for and loving lost loved ones and acquaintances the same way Jesus loved his disciples, the same way Jesus loved the crowds of Jews, the same way Jesus loved his brothers, the chief priests, and the Pharisees by offering living water to each and every person. So this week we have reviewed from the course relating to Christ, John's Gospel. We looked at chapter 6 and 7. I certainly pray that this review will help to add layers of understanding to your studies and that you will take these issues and matters that we have learned and pondered in this review to heart and that God will use this lesson to continue to deepen your sense of intimacy with the Lord Jesus. And also pray that each of you will come to grips with who Jesus really is and how your relationship with him should affect your lives. So until our next session, thank you for allowing me into your home. I look forward to continuing our study through John's gospel. And until we get a chance to meet again, may God bless and prosper you in every way. In Jesus name. Good night.